Welcome to a new episode of Ask the Expert. Today we have a real treat for you, Dr. Ned Hollowell, who is an adult and child psychiatrist and a world authority on ADHD. His unique approach has helped thousands of adults and children live happy and productive lives. In fact, Dr. Hallowell knows from firsthand experience. He has ADHD and dyslexia himself. He wrote the book on ADHD, Driven to Distraction, and has helped educate the world on what it means to have ADHD, helping people through his trademark approach to build upon their strengths instead of pathologize the condition. He is a highly recognized public figure. You probably have seen him interviewed on Oprah, Dr. Oz, Good Morning America, Dr. Phil, or The Today Show, just to name a few. He even has quite the universal following on TikTok, where he makes fun educational videos on his hashtag NedTalk series. Let's hear from Dr. Hollowell on answers to the questions he most frequently gets about ADHD. Dr. Hollowell, thank you so much for being here. It's my pleasure. So just for starters, can you tell us what is ADHD? What is ADHD? It is a way of being in the world. It is a unique way of being. It's defined uh, in the diagnostic manual uh, as a syndrome composed of distractibility, impulsivity, and hyperactivity. But it's so much more than that. People who have this condition are the, are the outliers, the creators, the developers, the entrepreneurs, the visionaries, the seers, the, the ones who, who, who disrupt and create and develop and grow. Um, and... and and struggle to stay on task when they're not interested. Boredom is our kryptonite. I have it myself. We, we, we can't stay put if, if, without stimulation, so we're stimulation seekers. You, you put all those together, trouble with planning, executive function, and you have a mish, mishmash of positives and negatives. And, and sort of my job as a professional is to maximize the positives and minimize the negatives. And if you do that, this condition can turn into a, a, a superpower. If you don't do that, it can really kind of ruin your life. So it's a very unique condition in that way. So how do you get a diagnosis if you think you might have ADHD? The way you get a diagnosis is to consult with a professional who has a lot of experience in diagnosing ADHD, whether you're a child or an adult. Uh, who these people might be could be a psychiatrist, psychologist, neurologist, pediatrician, internist, um, uh, family physician. Anybody in the medical or mental health field may have experience with ADHD, but you want to interview them carefully and make sure they do, because a lot of people think they understand ADHD and they don't. And this makes a big difference because you won't get an accurate and complete diagnosis unless you see a professional who has a lot of experience, um, and, and, and it, it just makes a huge difference. So it's worth doing the legwork, the homework, and finding someone. Uh, the best way to get a referral is to see, get a referral from someone else who's already seen that person. What are the most telling signs that a child might have ADHD? The most telling signs that anyone has ADHD, be it a child or an adult, uh, the most telling sign is unexplained underachievement. So a sixth grader who's not doing as well emotionally, behaviorally, academically as his or her IQ would predict or social background would predict or talents would predict, or an adult, same thing, not doing as well as their, you know, talent, uh, as their talents would predict. And, and so unexplained underachievement, by unexplained, it means it's not due to an obvious cause, like, like some kind of a hearing problem, vision problem, nutrition, nutritional problem, uh, you know, other mental conditions. So unexplained underachievement is, is the tip-off. And it's, it's a wonderful thing because often when the answer is ADHD, that underachievement just skyrot, skyrockets and becomes superachievement. Other things you look for are problems with executive function, planning, organizing, timeliness, tendency to procrastinate, uh, and, and those, those issues, as well as the positive symptoms, creativity, originality, energy, pizzazz, sparkle, uh, ability to, you know, just light up a room when you come into it. So, so the, the positives and the negatives, but unexplained underachievement is, is, the, is the hallmark to, to watch out for. So 
What goes into a best treatment plan for ADHD at any age? The best treatment for ADHD at any age includes several elements. It, it always starts with education. Most people do not understand what this condition is. And what they know about it is based on rumor and hearsay and just a lot of wrong information. So you have to kind of set them straight. And, and I use some analogies like you have a race car brain with bicycle brakes. Um, you're nearsighted and have never gotten eyeglasses, so you're squinting. You're driving on square wheels. You have to put in tremendous energy to get a short distance. Uh, those kinds of analogies to explain what it is. And then, of course, you can refer them to books. To, there's a ton of literature out there about it. But you want to begin with education. And I, I'll, I tell folks, I don't treat disabilities. I unwrap gifts. So you, you, want, to, you want to put it in a positive perspective. As you develop uh, this condition, as you work with this, you're only going to improve. Your life is only going to get better. So it's a very good news diagnosis because once you get the diagnosis, things can only get better. The only question is how much better. And, and often it's a lot better. So you start with education, then coaching, uh, lifestyle revision, how to get organized, how to get up in the morning, how to get dressed, um, how to be on time, how to beat the habit of procrastination. So coaching, uh, that can be done by a parent, by a colleague, by somebody else, or you can hire an ADHD coach. And then, and then some kind of somatic treatment, the most common being medication. Most people are afraid of medication. That's too bad because they shouldn't be. Medication, people ask me, do you believe in medication? And the answer is it's not a religious principle. It's a medication. And when it works, it's great. And when it doesn't work, you shouldn't use it. It's that simple. A trial of medication is a trial of medication. 80% of the time, you'll get really good results. 20% of the time, you won't. So it boils down to this. If you take the medication and it helps you and does not cause side effects, hooray, keep taking it. If you take the medication and it doesn't help or it does cause side effects, don't take it again. It's that simple. And it's been turned into this incredibly conflicted mishmash and ending up with most people being afraid of it. Uh, these meds, when they work, are an absolute godsend. Uh, do they do the whole job? No, they don't. But uh, they can be a tremendous asset and make coaching a lot easier, make learning a lot easier. Uh, the analogy is they operate very similar to eyeglasses. Is medication always needed if you have ADHD? Medication is not always needed. First of all, medication does not always work. 20% of the time it won't work or causes uh, intolerable side effects. So, so, so no, it is absolutely not necessary if, if you don't believe in it, if you don't want to take it, if you have some aversion to medication. You ought to subject that aversion to rational analysis before you throw it out. But you could, for, I don't take medication. It doesn't work for me. My medication is coffee, is caffeine. So in a sense, I do take medication, but not a prescription medication. Um, and there are many uh, non-medication interventions that should always be used, whether or not you use medication. So medication is a tool in our toolbox, but it is uh, neither a necessary nor a sufficient tool. So what are some of the newest and best non-medication treatments for ADHD? The newest and most interesting and promising non-medication treatments uh, which I write about in my new book, ADHD 2.0. Uh, right at the top of the list is cerebellar stimulation. The cerebellum is a part of your brain at the back and base of your brain. It's kind of an afterthought in medical training, but the fact is the cerebellum contains 70% of the neurons in your brain. It's way more important than we used to think. And the cerebellum has rich connections to the frontal lobes, which is where the action is in ADHD. And if you do physical exercises that stimulate the cerebellum, 10 minutes twice a day for three to six months, you will get marked improvement in the symptoms of ADHD. Sounds counterintuitive. How can a physical exercise influence attention, planning, executive function? Well, it does via the cerebellum and the, and the, uh, the, the network in, involving the inner ear. Uh, these exercises are balancing exercises, primarily standing on, on one leg, standing on one leg with your eyes closed. Um, there's a, a fellow in, in England who's developed a whole series of these exercises. Winford Dorr is his name. 
and it, he's, he calls it the Zing method, Z-I-N-G. Uh, you can learn about it by, by Googling that. Uh, but, but physical exercise that stimulates the cerebellum uh, is very promising and, and really, I think, will, will, will grow in, in applicability the more people learn about it. And then, of course, the, the standby, a coaching, uh, very helpful non-medication treatment. Um, the two things for adults I recommend, uh, marry the right person, find the right job. Sounds obvious, but you'd be amazed how many people don't. And, and you know, you, you, you want to be careful in, in what, you, what you sign up for, be it a career or a, or a, a mate. Um, and, and then uh, uh, really trying to embrace the condition, learn as much about it as you can, because everyone's ADHD is different. And learn as much as you can about yours, particularly through a strength-based lens. And, and then you want to do, and I put this right at the top of the list in terms of, of importance, find the right difficult. We ADHDers, we need a creative outlet. And we need it to be challenging, i.e. difficult. But it's got to be the right difficult. When you find the right difficult... Every day you can you can grapple with it and, and deal with it and and we need that we we're it, it's like we're cows we need to be milked we need to have our creativity milked and for me it's writing that's my right difficult no pun intended but my right difficult is writing I grapple with writing but it's challenging and it matters to me and so whenever I write I get that that creative uh, uh, offload if you will. Uh, yours might be building a business. Yours might be cooking. Yours might be gardening. Um, if you're a kid, it might be starting a Kool-Aid stand. It might be uh, drawing, coloring, uh, building a model airplane, whatever. But you need a creative outlet. We really need a creative outlet. So find your right difficult, whether you're five years old or 55 years old. or My oldest patient was 86. And with treatment, he was able to write the book he'd wanted to write his whole life long. Uh, so, so find your right difficult. I'd, I'd put right at the top of the list. Those are such such great tips. One of my best friends' daughter has uh, cerebellum atrophy, right? So I'm familiar with some of these exercises because for her, it's kind of for a different reason. We think about coaching and all these things. What about physical exercise as a creative outlet? Does that is that considered one? Physical exercise is hugely important in bringing out the best in ADHD, in unwrapping your gift, as I like to say. My colleague, uh, John Rady, wrote a whole book about it called Spark, the Revolutionary New Science of Exercise in the Brain. And it turns out that physical exercise is, in, is as good for your brain as it is for your body. Uh, so yes, build physical exercise into your day, however you do it. You don't have to go to a gym. Walking is, is real good. Whatever, whatever you're able to do and you enjoy. If you have a dog, walk the dog. And by the way, everyone should have a dog. Um, and, then, and then also hugging, laughing, uh, physical touch. And, you know, we've, we've been deficient in that because of COVID. But it's really good for you to get hugs. It's really good for you to laugh and make other people laugh. It's really good to be silly, to let yourself go, to uh, relax your inhibitions. Uh, and you don't have to use alcohol to do that if you just let yourself go a little bit. Be silly, roll around on the floor, you know, whatever it is. Um, and, and, you know, I hope it's okay to say on the podcast, but lovemaking is another form of physical exercise, if you will, that, that's really good for you at any age. And it's one of the few things in life that's free, fun, and good for you. So, so don't let that uh, leave your daily or weekly repertoire of activities. As always, thank you for listening to our podcast. If you enjoyed the show, drop us a review. If you haven't already, subscribe to our podcast for the latest episodes. For the latest insights, check us out at psychhub.com.